the big theme throughout the book um, is the difference between the scout mindset and the soldier mindset. Yeah. Can you describe what you mean by these two terms? Right. So soldier mindset is my metaphor for this really common default mode of thinking um, that humans are very often in, in which our motivation is to defend our pre-existing beliefs or defend something that we want to be true against any evidence or argument that might threaten those beliefs. And the, the metaphor is inspired by the, the fact that when we talk about reasoning or argumentation, our language is very militaristic. So we'll talk about, you know, defending our beliefs or, or buttressing a position or, you know, building a case or supporting a position. These are all language like that you would use to talk about a military position or, or a fortress you're defending. Um, and when we talk about encountering evidence or argument that contradicts it, we talk about uh, uh, attacking or shooting it down or poking holes in someone else's logic. Um, again, very militaristic. And so I call it soldier mindset, uh, but I, I, I didn't invent this phenomenon. A lot of people have written about it and spoken about it under other names like rationalizing or motivated reasoning or uh, wishful thinking or denial or confirmation bias. So uh, it's, it's kind of my umbrella term for, for all these phenomena. Um, and then scout mindset is my is an alternative to soldier mindset. So uh, a scout's role, unlike a soldier's, is not to go out and attack or defend. It's to go out and see things as clearly as possible and uh, and put together as accurate a map of the landscape or of a situation as you can. Um, so scout mindset is basically motivation to see things as they are and not as you wish they were. Um, so you know, being intellectually honest, being trying to be objective just being curious about what's actually true. Um, so I, I essentially felt like the thing that I felt was missing from the discourse about rationality was uh, a focus on, on motivation um, because most books and articles about improving reasoning tend to be focused on uh, giving people knowledge, like knowledge of cognitive biases or knowledge of lo logical fallacies. And it's not that that's not important. It's just that's not, you know, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but still uh, only use that knowledge to attack other people's positions, like you know the stereo stereotypical person on uh, Reddit or Twitter or whatever forum who you know is comes equipped with a list of cognitive biases and just uses it to like point out biases in other people's thinking and mm. never turns that lens on themselves. Mm. So uh, I just increasingly came to feel like intelligence and knowledge are great, but they're tools that can be directed. However, you're motivated to direct them. You can direct them towards um, trying to figure out what's actually true, even if it's not what you wish were true. Or you can direct it towards uh, finding clever ways to justify your preconceived beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I felt like the bottleneck is really more uh, the motivation that directs our, our thinking than about our knowledge and, and intelligence. Yeah, this is a really profound point, I think. And it's one that was also raised in my recent podcast with Jesse Single. Mm. The... Uh, the fact that intelligence doesn't actually have very much to do with having the sort of temperament that is open to say changing one's mind. Right. Right. Like it's, it's not the, you actually have a quote in your book that I think uh, gets at this very well, which is, you know, the point is, is simply that as people become better informed, they should start to converge on the truth. Uh, wh wherever it happens to be. Instead, we see the opposite pattern. As people get better informed, they diverge. So I guess there's two points here. Right. One is that whatever we're thinking of as raw intelligence, um, you know, whether, whether you think IQ measures that or not, um, having more of that doesn't necessarily give you more accurate beliefs about the world. In fact, I, rem I remember at one point reading an article about the the person who had the either the highest or one of the highest IQ scores ever measured. Mm -hmm. And this person was like a, a foaming at the mouth, white supremacist, conspiracy theorist, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just believed all kinds of crazy things about who was controlling the world and no doubt used his intelligence to, to connect those dots in, in as interesting a, a, a way as possible. But these are these things are are disturbingly orthogonal or uh, intelligence and and then knowing about even knowing about a particular subject even 
and then having accurate beliefs. And so it right. seems to me what your book is about, it's about thinking clearly, but it's, it's not about intelligence as a means to thinking clearly or becoming better informed as a, as a means to thinking clearly. It's about a, a certain uh, temperate um, sort of personality, cu- cultivating a personality trait that is not intelligence or, or uh, sort of the desire to become informed. Is that right? That, that's very well put. Yeah. The, the only thing I would amend is that I'm, I'm not saying that intelligence isn't useful. Mm. Um, and I think I, I expect that intelligence and knowledge do correlate with getting the right answer in many domains. Um, mm. It's just specifically in domains where you have some, they're ideologically fraught in some way or emotionally fraught in some way. So uh, the, the, the studies that I was referencing when I, when I wrote that line about, you know, people become, as you look increasingly up the scale of, of intelligence and knowledge, like scientific education, people's opinions diverge instead of converging mm. on a shared truth. Um, I, was, I was specifically referencing a study about people's views on ideologically charged scientific topics like climate change or, uh, or stem cell research or um, the origins of the universe. Um, and so, so the point isn't that intelligence can't help you get the right answer. It's that when you have some ideological or emotional motivation to, to defend a particular answer that may or may not be true because it's, you know, what you want to believe for personal or, or political reasons, um, then intelligence and knowledge don't help you and can in fact backfire because they just help you, uh, you know, cleverly argue your way to the, to the view that you wanted to hold. Right. So I'm making a distinction between those two different, um, domains. So... I think many people recognize this now more and more in their lives, trying to have conversations with friends and family members about charged political topics, whether that is climate change or, uh, you know, the, who you're voting for. Mm -hmm. And, um, people, this is a, this is a, a very visceral issue for people because you risk, uh, on the one hand, you want to develop as accurate a picture of the world as possible. At least many people do. And I, I at think least in al- theory. at least in theory and almost yeah. anyone would, would claim that they do. On the other hand, so much of what we care about in life is connected to being approved of by our immediate circle, by, by a, a chosen tribe. Mm-hmm. Um, and that tribe can be many different things, but those two goals are are necessarily going to be in tension at least much of the time. Yeah. And negotiating that is very difficult. Um, you know, the deci- in some sense you're you're always deciding between between you know, the one of the central determinants of of human happiness, which is to feel part of a group. And to pursue the truth wherever it may lead. And both of these things seem so important that it's very difficult to know what to do when they're in conflict. Yeah. No, that, that's, that's absolutely true. And I, uh, I think it's really important to acknowledge the, the reasons why we are so often in soldier mindset. Um, like, what is it giving us or what? you know, what are we trying to get with it? Mm -hmm. Uh, whether or not it's actually effective at that there, you know, there's reasons that we're in soldier mindset. Um, we're trying to, to feel good, to feel good about ourselves and our lives. And we're trying to look good to other people. We're trying to look smart and virtuous and we're trying to fit into our, to our peer groups and to our workplaces and our communities, um, and our political tribes. And, and I don't want to dismiss any of that as unimportant or unnecessary because clearly that's all necessary, as you say, for being, you know, a happy, fulfilled human being. Um, and so there is often a, a tension between the goals of scout mindset and the goals of soldier mindset, uh, at least in the short term. So part of what I argue in the book is that, you know, it's not that we're stupid or crazy by being in soldier mindset. Uh, there are these valuable things that we're trying to get with it. But soldier mindset also comes with these downsides of impairing our judgment and making it harder for us to think clearly. And there are all of these ways in which having false or distorted beliefs in one domain can kind of 
ripple throughout your network of beliefs and impact you in other ways and, and you know, have unpredictably bad consequences for your mm. own decision making. Um, so, so soldier mindset has these downsides and, and fortunately, I think we can, uh, it, it's very rare that we actually need soldier mindset to feel good or look good. Mm. And with a, a little bit of extra sort of care and strategicness, um, and, you know, how we live our life, how we design our life and how we think about our lives, we can be happy and confident and, um, and, you know, fit into our community as well without having to resort to mm. self-deception. 